please take part. It'll take you about five or ten seconds, and it just gives us a good idea about who you are and what you think. Please remain on mute the entire time. Please be, well, you don't need to be polite and courteous because actually when you produce all your lovely questions, um, Hannah and I will collate and we'll, we'll ask the ones that we think cover the, the ground generally. Um, and the final point I'd like to make is we're a very small charity and we do rely entirely on donations. So if this, is, if this thing this evening makes you happy, please feel free to donate. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mary Colwell, our fine founder and CEO. Thank you very much, Roger. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We've got a really nice crowd tonight um, for a very, very important topic. It's a topic for those of us who are immersed in curly conservation that has grown in importance over the last few years. Um, it was kind of always there in the background, but I would say over the last two or three years has taken on a really significant part of the thinking that anyone in conservation to do with ground nesting birds has got to try and get their head around. Um, and so it's great that we've got such a, a really interesting um, uh, panel tonight. People who are really involved in this issue and will be able to sort of lay out the ground, lay out the issues so that you'll be able to understand all the, com all the complexities and the, and the checks and balances that we have to come up with. Um, so I will start off by asking our panel very briefly to give us uh, up to five minutes each about who they are and why they're, why they're on the panel tonight and what their take is, what they specifically will be talking about when it comes to curlews and conservation. So I'm going to start, first of all, by introducing you to Patrick Laurie. Patrick lives in Dumfries and Galloway. He is a farmer. He's an author of a book called Native. Is it Life in a Vanishing Landscape? Living in a vanishing landscape. Uh, a book about farming in that area uh, with the encroachment of trees and the loss of curlews. It's an absolutely wonderful book, actually. It's one of my all time favourites. So, Patrick, do you want to tell everybody why you've been invited on this panel? Hello, Mary. Can you hear me? Yep. Brilliant. Um, Hello, my name's um, Patrick. I'm speaking to you from De Vries and Galloway. I'm a um, farmer working with Galloway cattle here in a place that used to be very famous for, for its curlews. It used to, well, they reckon it, this is one of the best places in Scotland for curlews, um, probably until the 60s or 70s, uh, when a lot of things all came together at once to, to, to drive them into an incredibly dramatic decline. We're now at a stage where we're, we're, we're really sort of skimming our, skimming our, our, our bottom on the ground here with the last few pairs of birds we've got. Um, so I've been involved in um, working on a few farms and I'm also do some more than management advisory work. I work with um, an organization called Working for Waders in Scotland that's trying to coordinate some stuff um, for wading birds. But um, principally, my experience is, is, is quite practical. Um, but where I live, huge, huge, big change in land use going on at the moment is, is around um, expansion of commercial forestry. Um, and even as we were talking just now before the seminar started, I'm really interested to hear the conversation we have this evening about the situation in England, um, because it's very different across the border. And it's also very different even within Scotland. It's very different in Galloway, where I am. Um, and the statistic that I, I quite like is that uh, since the last agri-environment scheme, which allowed uh, what well, funded woodland creation, um, here in the south of Scotland, we've had 14,000 hectares of new uh, softwood planting gone in gone into into this part of Scotland, um, which is twice the rest of Scotland put together. So we're seeing an incredibly intensive, speedy land use change here. And for all the reasons I'm sure we'll go into, that's just, just been disastrous for our curlews. So I'm fascinated to see how the conversation goes this evening. Um, and I really hope my fear, I think, probably is that our curlews are, 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 are knackered. They're, they're probably not going to be able to come back from what's happened to them. Um, I can still try and do all I can, um, both from an advisory perspective, from a farming perspective, from a, fr from all sorts of different angles. I can still do what I can for the birds here, but I'm really very keen that what's happened here doesn't ever happen anywhere else in the country. So um, one of the um, contributions maybe I'd like to help with this evening is kind of feeding in a little bit of my experiences from, from Galloway. That's more than enough from me to get started with. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Patrick. So next we'll go to Claire Pinches. Claire is from Natural England um, and Claire has been very involved in setting a sort of forestry uh, standards, if you like. I, I always use the wrong words, Claire. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I will let you take over to give us an overview of how England is going to try and meet its planting targets and what those targets are. Thank you, Mary. Yes, um, I, I, I am not really involved in setting forestry standards. That's very much forestry Please commission. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll leave them to describe what that, what that looks like um, in, in due course. But yeah, thanks very much for having me. It's really great to be on this panel uh, alongside some uh, uh, Natural England and Forestry Commission uh, colleagues who will no doubt kind of help out with the, uh, the answering the questions. Uh, I'm Clem Pitchers. I've worked at Natural England for almost 20 years now, principally as a national grassland specialist, um, providing our device and training to our own staff and managing research and monitoring projects and using the resultant evidence from those projects to inform our advice on policy and um, operational delivery like agri-environment schemes, for example. And I've really retained that evidence led focus in my current work uh, role, which is working very closely with colleagues in Natural England, Forestry Commission, Woodland Trust and Indefra to ensure that government's tree target, the English government's tree target, is delivered in a way which supports the protection and recovery of nature, whilst also helping um, the carbon to deliver the carbon sequestration needed to reach the net zero target and, of course, a, a wide range of other public benefits. And that this work so far has um, included a major investment in time in development of new joint guidance between Forestry Commission and Natural England um, on peat and new forestation, and of course in the um, development of very recently launched guidance to help inform um, joint FC, NE and uh, DEFRA guidance on breeding waders and new woodland creation guidance, which I'll touch on today. So in England, the government's committed to um, a trebling of woodland creation rates in England by the end of this parliament and set a legally, also set a legally uh, binding target to halt species decline by 2030 through the Environment Act. And clearly the establishment of new woods, trees and woody shrubs has an absolutely pivotal role to play in supporting the recovery of nature by injecting much needed uh, structural complexity into our landscapes, which really ha you know, has disappeared in, in many places. However, a course where this treed habitat goes uh, critically influences its ability to enable nature's recovery. And that's what we're clearly touching on here, the tension really between that. And it's recognised, of course, that there are some circumstances where delivery of the tree planting ambitions may exacerbate the decline of species of consecration conservation concern if new woodlands aren't appropriately sited. And this, of course, in, in, includes critically endangered breeding waders species, including the curlew that has its largest remaining global um, breeding populations in the UK and is very reliant on open habitats here. So woodland creation can adversely affect populations by replacement and fragmentation of those open habitats in which curlew breed and feed and also increase the risk of predation, as I'm sure we'll go um, into discussing in the so-called predation halo. So in England, you'll be well aware, we, we, we have retained um, for a variety of reasons, um, populations of, um, of curlew in the uplands, uh, areas of Northern England, um, but that's of, often where land values are low. And for that reason, because the agricultural return off that land is low, they've um, also tended to be very popular for woodland creation projects due to the marginal agricultural nature of the, um, the farming there. And indeed, this is where Forestry Commission and other partners, such as the Woodland Trust, have really seen most interest in woodland creation proposals in the Cumbrian, Northumbrian and, and Yorkshire uplands. And clearly, this poses somewhat of a, uh, a kind of wicked problem, policy problem, in, uh, it, and, and requires some careful resolution. And that resolution's really demanded very close collaboration between the Forestry Commission, Natural England, and relevant DEFRA policy teams. And that's resulted in um, some recently published joint guidance, which really does help inform those applying, those applicants who are wanting to create 
woodland, um, woodland, new woodland, where this activity is likely to be most appropriate and pose least risk to breeding waders. And throughout that process, and it's been quite a long process, and Lisa will, <laughs> will have, <laughs> she's been in it every step of the way, and we've been working very closely together. We've worked really, really hard to make um, use of the best available evidence, including that provided by the BTO, their breeding wader zonal maps, um, which were published towards the end of last year. And of course, literature, using literature on um, predation impacts, whilst recognising that in this area, and I'm sure we'll come into, onto that, um, is this issue in the uh, questions and the discussion, that there are actually some quite considerable evidence gaps. And, you know, we're actively taking steps to address these. So, I just wanted to kind of reassure people that we're kind of at the start of this process and the current guidance that we've got operating in England will be reviewed again in 12 months time and that will draw that review will draw on the practical um, experience of those implementing the guidance and the experience of applicants but it will also allow the findings of um, newly commissioned research that we've got going with the British Trust for Ornithology to be fed in to help kind of constantly improve it really or improve it for, for next year. So I look forward to um, yeah participating in the discussion. I think I'm handing so. over to Phil. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And we're on to Phil next. And Phil is also from Natural England, but his role is very much uh, looking at it as an ornithologist. So trees and ornithology and um, and the role that trees can and cannot have in the conservation of waders. So over to you, Phil. Thanks very, thanks very much, Mary, and thank you very much for inviting me. So I've worked as an ornithologist in the statutory conservation agencies for over 30 years. In fact, for those of you a bit long in the tooth, I think I was probably the last scientist to be taken on by the Nature Conservancy Council, if you can remember back that far. Um, I'm currently a principal specialist uh, working as part of a team of nationally based bird specialists who advise on terrestrial, coastal and marine birds. So my work uh, involves overseeing the birds team input to the birds and wooden creation work area. But I also sorry, mute there. I also work on the design, the delivery, and evaluation of agri environment schemes for birds, which has some relevance here. And also I oversee our bird species recovery work. Um, so you may have heard of our species recovery program. I've long been involved in that, which also has relevance to this to this work area. So my main interest here is to ensure that the threatened birds of England's open landscapes have a sustainable future, whilst at the same time maximising the opportunities that planting trees can have for the birds of woodland habitats or wooded habitats more generally, including scrub, for example, many of which are also threatened. So hence that you know trade off um, to achieve this. I, I believe we need to develop a collective view uh, as, as a community, as a conservation community, if you like, of what parts of the countryside we want to stay as open landscapes and what parts we would like to see as more wooded for all the benefits that Claire has mentioned. And at the same time, we need to do this in a way that recognises our national and international obligations and commitments to conserving biodiversity, as well as those that we, we have for tackling climate change. And most of all, I want our decisions to be as evidence led as possible. Now, Claire has mentioned that we don't have perfect evidence. I mean, we never have perfect evidence, but there are some some significant evidence, ga evidence gaps in this area. Um, and, you know, I want us to all the time be evolving our policies and practices in the light of new evidence, new science. And we are taking steps to, to that effect, um, which we can talk about. But I also, you know, I think there's probably more that we can do in that regard. Um, so I think, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll 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 come on to some. Yeah, very interested in the questions later. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much, Phil. Um, and then over to you, Lisa. Lisa is from the Forestry Commission, and I'm not even going to try and get the term terminology right this time. I'm going to let you, Lisa, just tell us how the Forestry Commission uh, fits into this complex landscape between DEFRA and Natural England and tree planting. Thanks very much, Mary. Good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm Lisa Kerslake. I am the area ecologist for the Forestry Commission covering Yorkshire and North East England. One of five area ecologists for the Commission in England. It's a relatively new role. 
Um, you'll all obviously be aware of the England Tree Action Plan. Well, you may not be, but there is an England Tree Action Plan um, and the tree planting targets that the Forestry Commission is very much aiming to try to achieve. Um, and as Claire mentioned, that's that's looking at trebling woodland creation levels in England, which is obviously quite a significant um, target. Um, but when you look at the fact that we only have in England about 10% woodland cover compared to 38% in Europe, for example, it doesn't really seem so, so outrageous, if you like. And of course, tree planting, woodland creation is also very important for biodiversity and climate change and achieving that, that magical 2050 net zero target. And there are many grants out there, many grants and incentives out um, that are available to help applicants, landowners and others um, achieve these, these targets. Oh, no, that also set within a, a strong UK wide regulatory framework, which is set by the um, UK forestry standard, which covers the whole of the UK, not just not just England. So my job basically, and I should say I'm not a bird specialist. If I have any specialist specialism at all, it's um, botany and mammals. Uh, and by the way, Phil, my first ever job was with the Nature Conservancy Council, so I do very much remember those days. Um, so my job is very much about right tree, right place. Um, and this is really just trying to ensure that where woodland creation is happening, we aren't causing damage to other interests. And it don't just cover waders, breeding birds, but also priority habitat and peat, um, which again, um, uh, Claire's also meant, or already mentioned about open habitats. So key, the key in this is obviously to ensure that new woodland doesn't have any unacceptable impacts on other, other land use interests. And it's a very important, I think, to say that forestry didn't cause the decline of waders. It was already coming about by other means, which we may touch on later. Um, but actually adding that into the equation can make things a lot worse and that's obviously something that that we need to avoid and people who are trying to get trees into the ground quite often say to me oh the situation is much better in scotland because they have these you know thresholds for curlew and blah 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 but actually as Patrick was intimating earlier, the situation in parts of Scotland is actually quite dire and, and the curlew losses in, in Scotland have actually been a lot greater than in England. And um, as you say, we don't we don't want to see that, that continuing. So as Claire also mentioned, I have been involved in the development of the, the recent guidance um, and we're also contributing as an organisation to various bits of research going on that, that Claire also mentioned. For example, work with the BTO on woodland bird assemblages. So looking, you know, where where, where can new woodland be of most benefit um, to, to birds, not just the, the breeding waders, but other assemblages of birds. Um, and we're looking, we were talking to Russell actually not that long ago about small projects researching into predation and edge effects from woodland you know is there any difference between conifers and broad leaves in terms of impacts on on wading birds does what what effect does topography have traditionally we say curly don't nest on slopes but you know how steep a slope um, and all these things are really important things that we need to start plugging those evidence gaps um, so that's all i'll say for now thanks very much thank you very much that's really um that's really interesting and then to um the last speaker, actually, uh, who is Russell Wynn. Now, Russ and I work very closely together for the Curlew Recovery Partnership. Russ is the uh, Curlew Recovery Partnership manager, which means he does all the heavy lifting, basically. Um, and uh, uh, the Curlew Recovery Partnership will explain what that is to those you don't know. Uh, we are very, very involved in this discussion about the relationship between curlews and trees. So I'll hand over to Russ to give an overview of where uh, an organisation like the CRP, as we call it, the Curly Recovery Partnership, where it sits in this very complex landscape of how many trees, where we're we going to put the trees, and how do curlews butt up against all these issues? Thanks, Russ. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm Russ, uh, manager of the Curly Recovery Partnership. So, what is the Curly Recovery Partnership? Well, we are here to look out for curlews, as Mary said at the, the start of this meeting. Um, and I think what we can provide is a very broad uh, partnership, um, almost unique actually amongst particularly the bird world. Uh, we have major environmental NGOs like RSPB, BTO, WWT, uh, Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. We've got Natural England uh, on there. Uh, we've got some specific Curlew NGOs like Curlew Action and Curlew Country. We've also got major landowning interests represented by Duchy of Cornwall, uh, and Bolton Castle Estate, Tom Ord Powlett, who's also uh, one of the executive of the Moorland Association. So we've got a really broad church and that enables us, uh, particularly Mary and I as the independent 
chair and manager to bring that independent and objective perspective to some quite difficult issues. So that means that we're here to support the DEFRA family and its agencies. Many of our, our colleagues are here today, which is great. But also when it's right is to provide appropriate challenge as well, because we do need to look out for curlew uh, and they're not doing very well. Just to give you some context, so we're all dealing with the same facts and figures. Um, at the moment, we are looking at officially 58,500 breeding pairs of curlew in the UK. Roughly half of those are in England, but we suspect that's very much at the upper end of the real figure today. A lot of these data are quite old now. So we might be playing with something around 25 to 30,000 pairs of curlew in England and a, and a similar number in Scotland. But probably 98, 99% of those curlews in England are in the Pennine chain in the uplands and the hinterland uh, to the upland area. So that's where we really need to focus. And the big problem we've got, habitat loss traditionally has been a big issue, uh, but today there is some nibbling around the edges, losses to urban development and, and drainage of wetlands. But the big issue is low productivity. So we need to be producing about uh, 0.5 chicks per pair of curlews per year to break even for a stable population. And we're not even making half that. So basically for every four pairs of curlew, they're struggling to fledge one chick per year at the minute. Uh, and that's a really damning statistic. Two key reasons, predation of eggs and chicks and losses due to grass cutting through silage and, and hay uh, operations, agricultural operations. So that's the issue. So we've brought together about 350 members of our network. If you're not joined up, go to the Curlew Recovery Partnership website and you'll find the email that will come straight through to me and we can add you to our network to make sure that you're part of this community that's now trying to uh, turn it around for curlews in England. What we're we doing around forestry, uh, we've done three things uh, recently. We've met with the chair of the Forestry Commission, Sir William Worsley, and a couple of his colleagues to get across the case for why curlews and other breeding waders really need to be carefully considered in this process. And it's really encouraging to see them being taken very seriously at the highest level in Forestry Commission and Natural England. Uh, so that's good. We're setting up our own expert working group to look at some of the issues and we're going to be linking into colleagues in Curly Wales and working for waders um, as part of that. And we hope to have colleagues from DEFRA, Forestry Commission, Natural England, but also some of the big environmental NGOs uh, they're in-house experts sitting on that working group. So again, to bring a broad perspective to talk through some of the issues. Uh, and as Lisa mentioned, we're looking to set up some master's projects to get some quick results, potentially next summer, uh, around issues like different woodland types. How might they affect the predator levels that spill out onto the adjacent countryside that can then predate curlew eggs and chicks? How far do these predators roam? Obviously, a fox might have a different halo around a woodland area compared to something like a, a breeding pair of ravens. And I think there's a lot we can learn from other countries. Mary and I have been talking a lot about areas like Finland, where they have quite a lot of forestry, quite a lot of natural forest, and you've got curlews breeding relatively close to that in a quite heterogeneous landscape. We think of curlews in this country as being birds of big open upland areas or big lowland uh, floodplain meadows. But in Finland, they're breeding, you know, apparently quite well still in, in northern and central Finland in quite heterogeneous landscapes. But it may be that there's a very different predator guild in those landscapes where you've still got species like brown bear, wolverine, you know, some of the big owls that are predating things like foxes and mustelids and corvids that in this country don't have natural predators. Uh, and that's why the whole issue of whether we need to be implementing predator control, to what extent we need to be implementing in this country, is in part because we don't have those apex predators that would normally keep those meso predators in, in check. So there's a lot I think we can learn from what's happening in, in other countries uh, around this, this forestry issue. I just finished so some of the, the prompts for sort of discussion for today. Things that are occupying my mind and Mary's mind and our colleagues on the CRP steering group are yeah, we need to meet these tree planting targets. We need to mitigate uh, climate impacts. We need to draw down carbon quickly. It'd be great if we could just do natural regeneration everywhere, but we need to lock up carbon faster uh, and that needs you know, fast growing non-native conifer species in some areas. Um, but how can we balance off this dire situation that Curlew and many other breeding waders are in against these targets? And we accept as the CRP that it's likely there's going to need to be a compromised position, but where do we draw the line? Do we say, if we've got 25,000 pairs of curlew in England today, do we accept that to meet our tree planting targets, we might drop down to 15 or 20,000 breeding pairs of curlew in the next few decades? 
And is that an acceptable trade off? That might be a pragmatic view. But then again, does the CRP should we draw a line and say, well, actually, we can't afford to lose any curlews given their current predicament. So that's an open discussion that we and our working group will be having in the coming months. If a tree planting scheme is approved in an area where there are some breeding curlews at low density, say 10 pairs might be impacted, would we accept some mitigation where some money coming from that scheme is used to improve habitat in a curlew area elsewhere? or is used to fund predator control elsewhere, both lethal and non-lethal, to try and improve the productivity. Because we know that in this country, it's productivity that is the key issue um, at the moment. Again, that's a trade-off that even within our steering group, we're starting to see some quite disparate views around that and different perspectives. And it will be the job of Mary and I as chair and manager, with all of the expert input, to make sense of that and come up with some decisions and, and, and inform the Natural England and the Forestry Commission and ultimately the DEFRA process uh, around the policy that comes comes out of it. So that's that's where we are. There's some of the things that we're doing at the minute. And these are some of the issues that we're, we're starting to think about um, going forwards. Oh, thank you very much. That's a very good summary. Thank you, Ross. Uh, can I remind everybody, if you have questions, please do pop them in the chat. Um, whatever comes into your mind, put it in there and uh, Roger and Hannah will collate them all and you'll be able to get your points across to the panel uh, when we've had an open discussion. So I think the very first question, I think, going right back to basics, let's start from, from number one. What is woodland? And we bandy this word around, what are trees, what are woodland? Um, I mean, to me, that could mean anything from an old growth oak forest somewhere uh, through to some rewilding, through to a plantation of Sitka spruce. So I'm going to ask the panel to give me um, their definition of what we when when we say we want a lot more woodland cover, what does that actually mean in terms of these very different concepts of what a woodland is? Um, so I'll ask first of all. Let me go straight to, to Patrick. First of all, do you do you have that variety of different woods and uh, that you're you, when you say you have a lot of tree cover recently in Dumfries and Galloway? Is it all plantation or are you seeing rewilding projects and oak forests as well? Uh, we're really not seeing a lot of rewilding projects. We're really not seeing a lot of kind of diverse woodland creation. And I don't know whether it's helpful, but woodland and forestry fit into two different kind of slots in my head. Certainly the huge majority of what we're seeing is is um, spruce plantation, uh, non-native spruce plantation, which uh, a huge amount went in in the 70s and 80s um, and is now kind of maturing, is going into second generation. Second generation is a bit better, but the rate at which um, marginal grazing and hill ground is going into these exactly same kind of same, essentially the same spirit of of, of, of management. Um, it's just eating up, eating up um, curlew habitats. And I'm always a bit frustrated traveling to other parts of Scotland um, where there are mechanisms in place to kind of mitigate some of the harm that can be done um, because it's clear that there are lots of balances and lots of ways to trade one against the other and to make sure that there aren't huge knock-on effects with one i come home and, and that's not what's happening here so so there's a very very single-minded approach here which actually has knock-on effects to all sorts of things way beyond curlews and this is beyond your question also um, mary but i mean it's also who's who's buying this land and what sort of price is this land being um, sold for? And um, the, I mean, this is a this is a massive socioeconomic problem way beyond biodiversity problem. And so for somebody who's been interested in curlews for a little while, it's interesting to see this coming up and up the agenda, not just because it's terrible for curlews, but it's it's terrible for people, too. Um, and so um, to, probably to, to have a go at answering your question in my mind's eye, I'm thinking immediately it's spruce plantation because there are only a few fragments of native woodland. And, and I personally draw quite a clear distinction. Dumfries and Galloway is a huge county um, and it is two halves. It's Dumfriesia and Galloway. There's quite a cool rewilding project that's going on towards Moffat, which is Dumfriesia's Carafran Wild Woods, which you quite often see photographs being posted of it on. That's awesome. Um, but but it's a good hour and a bit's drive away away from here. So when people say, oh, here's a flagship project for what's going on in the south of Scotland, that that is that's one project. I mean, they're talking about good stuff potentially at Langham and the Taris project. That's that's a, that's another project. Uh, I don't think people maybe give credit to how big the south of Scotland is, how enormous this problem is and how few 
the chinks of hope and and kind of optimism are here. Um, that's that's a, a long way, a long walk around your your question. Okay, there, no, that's that's a very helpful because I would put you then, Patrick, in the in the kind of what bad looks like when you just cover somewhere in Sitka spruce. And I'm hoping that Claire is now going to put me right on that. And that is not what your guidance is saying. No, and I suppose, I mean, I'm, I'm, I will, uh, it would be good to, to, to bring Lisa into this as well, because I mean, certainly in, in England, and I think it applies to uh, Scotland too, the National Forestry Inventory, the actual kind of technical definition of woodland in Great, well, actually in Great Britain is, um, uh, uh, any forest or woodland cover of at least 0.5 hectares. It has a technical definition in area um, with a minimum width of 20 metres that has at least 20% tree canopy cover. So actually that's quite interesting because that tree canopy cover is really quite low in terms of what counts as woodland, you know, um, following the, the the kind of Forestry Commission's own own definition. And so of course, I mean, Patrick's very um, ably articulated there's a significant difference between um, the type of uh, single age um, non-native woodland stand to that of, um, you know, a, a structurally diverse um, native woodland uh, habitat. But I would say that there are, um, you know, we need we need to recognise that the from a biodiversity perspective, whilst those native uh, tree and shrubs undoubtedly sustain uh, a a far wider range of um, species than the um, the uh, more um, uh, species poor um, non-native conifer plantations. There are means and ways of diversifying those systems too that we need to uh, we need to bear in mind. Um, and and I know actually there are efforts to basically look at um, increasing their value for for nature. I would also say from a natural England perspective. We um, and, and it's recognised actually in terms of the the tree target in England that doesn't just cover woodland proper, i.e. the the twenty percent um, uh, cover. It also covers wood pasture, um, which is a really rich, incredibly rich habitat in its own right because of that um, basically um, intimate mix of open and and treed habitat, but also scrub and successional habitat too. And obviously that can be achieved um, by using natural colonisation. Um, natural regeneration is, is within woodlands. Natural colonisation is the establishment of woodland on open land rather than planting. So that's another kind of differentiation in terms of uh, of um, the way that you can grace basically create and sustain um, greater di uh, uh, greater interest for, for biodiversity is there um uh, and this is probably open to to both Lisa and, and you well anybody but Lisa and Claire maybe particularly do you have a sort of target in your mind that there's going to be say 30 percent Sitka 70 percent broadleaf or is that just not not the way it works could you explain how how you kind of balance those two because plantations you know have a, have an economic function as well as a biodiversity one um yeah just to pick up on that i mean we 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 quite often not largely in the hands of people who come forward with tree planting proposals but quite often they they come to us with a very clear idea of what they want and it's important to note that the uk forestry standard does set minimum amounts for things like if, even if you're putting a, a spruce plantation in um for a broad native broadleaves in there plus open space there's always some allowance for that in in all schemes and that that's a really important thing to remember um and obviously we advise people who come to us the tree planting schemes and if it's a, a sensitive site then you know we we may say to them that in this particular situation you know you need to consider upping your percentage of, of, of broad leaves to make this acceptable or whatever and it has been really interesting how it, when I look at the the the, the way that the the uh, the, the schemes are coming in across England, as I think it was Claire picked up earlier, as so much of the large scale um, conifer plantation is coming in in the north. Further south you go, my colleagues in, in other parts of England are dealing with much smaller, largely native um, woodland creation, which is obviously a lot less controversial um, and a lot easier to get through the system if, if, if there are any conflicts. Um, and, you know, you've, you've, you've also got the issue of trying to in, in that open space trying to incorporate if there are any priority habitats or other features that need to be maintained you know 
how 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 do we deal with those? Um, so I think as as an organisation, we're 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 tied to some extent by what comes our way, um, but where we can, we try to diversify that where we can. Thank you, uh, Phil. From a from the ornithologist point of view, does it make any difference as far as you're concerned for the waders particularly, whether we're talking plantations or uh, regeneration or rewilding or broad leaf woodland? Uh, that's a very good question, Mary. I mean, that is an evidence gap, to be to be frank. Um, so, you know, we, we have some studies which show, I mean, obviously, if you're talking about excluding them from habitat, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of difference, really. Uh, and I accept that in other countries, you know, waders can open country waders or waders we think of as open country can persist. But in this country, they don't you know, we don't have many examples of that. And that may be because we have very partition management to date in the way we we look at habitats and we don't, we, you know, maybe with rewilding schemes, we will, we might start to see these intimate mosaics of open and scrubby and closed and wood pasture type habitats. And it may be that there could be some persistence, but we just don't have that experience to date here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's good to look abroad, but I think we, you know, that as Russ said, there's some very, could be some very different context um, for, you know, waders in the, living in those environments in other countries. In terms of um, the sort of predator halo, we don't really know. I suspect there could be some differences. Um, for example, um, if there was woodland creation going on in an area, you know, in a in a damp area. For example, alongside a, a river or in a in a very wet area, um, you know, foxes don't like having their feet being wet. They probably won't be as dense in those situations as they might be if it was dried out. And in a lot of situations, you do need to dry the land out for forestry anyway. Um, but yeah, um, I, we don't we don't really know. Um, we are doing some work with the BTO, which is attempting to look to see if the configuration and the extent of woodland within uh, a landscape actually allows waders to persist uh, for any length of time. And that will help us refine the guidance because it may be that at low levels, waders can persist. Um, but that's something we'll, you know, we need to wait until sort of early next year to get those results. Mm. But I think it is something, and, and it may be something that these MSC projects could help with. Um, because we are seeing new woodland going in and we have had, you know, other, you know, schemes that have been in place for a while, potentially look, you know, having a, a sort of continuum of woodland densities and configurations and looking at, you know, what the predator populations, both avian and mammalian, are doing in those different woodland types and woodland configurations could be a really useful uh thing to be to be doing and there might be some quite interesting ways perhaps using dummy plasticine eggs that you could even look at the predation pressure without having to you know disturb lots of waders by doing it and it's always very difficult to get sample sizes they have been used in other studies uh, they have their, their flaws but it could be an interesting thing so i think that would be well worth exploring thank you phil so just to summarize that then that we have this huge the tree planting target. I mean, I read somewhere that by 2050 we want to increase the tree cover to to be roughly to be the equivalent of Norfolk and Suffolk combined, which is a big area, really. Um, and it's going to be a mixture of of conifer and other woodland types. And that isn't a set target. That's going to fluctuate depending on where the trees are going and and who applies to put them in. Um, and that will obviously take away habitat for ground nesting birds by simply just covering them in trees so they won't be able to nest there. But the other thing that's been hinted at in all the conversations up till now is the predator pressure that comes out of planting trees. And I'd like to um, ask actually, uh, Russ, actually, if you will just summarise um, the relationship between woodlands and, and predators in terms of, of waders. Yeah, thanks, Mary. So uh, there's an increasing number of studies, not just from this country, but from um, elsewhere in, in Europe as well, 
that basically shows that once you put in a woodland uh, block, then the predators move out from that block in a halo that can extend anything from a few hundred meters to a few kilometers. And due to experimental and, and survey constraints, most of those studies have only gone out to maybe 500 meters to one kilometer. Uh, but we know that realistically something like a raven would be flying far further than that. So these halos could extend several kilometers over the landscape. So. Yeah, there's something about how you configure the woodland that's a really key component of how we think about this in a strategic way. And my concern and the CRP's concern at the moment is that these tree planting targets are largely currently being met by people coming forward with their own proposals in a rather piecemeal and unstrategic way. Uh, and that's just a function of the way the system's set up at the minute. There is a shortage of sites. There's a shortage of people that want to do large scale tree planting on their land. So at the moment, basically someone that comes forward with a scheme is, is considered very seriously. But as a result, it's not strategic. So the default is we end up with lots of small patches of forest spread across England, both upland and lowland. The problem from a wader point of view is what that does is it provides stepping stones for predators such as foxes and corvids. Uh, and it enables them to permeate out from those wooded areas into a wider area of landscape than if you just had, say, one really big or a small number of really big blocks of uh, woodland in suitable areas for those woodlands to grow. Uh, and you left big areas of extensive upland or floodplain meadow or whatever unplanted. So that's probably the sort of pragmatic but utopian vision for Curlew. And unfortunately, the way the default is going is we're going to end up with this very patchy, heterogeneous landscape that's going to be brilliant for predators where you've got woodland for them to shelter and you know, nest and breed in. And then you've got all these adjacent open areas for them to roam over effectively, mopping up not just waders, but invertebrates, you know, reptiles, amphibians, anything that they can get. Generalist predators are not, are not choosy. Um, so that's one of our concerns, and, and it'd be interesting to hear from Lisa and Claire, maybe, and Phil, if there's any counter to that default situation, which is the one that we're sort of moving towards at the moment. Before uh, you answer that, you guys, I just want to ask uh, Patrick here, um, what about, have you noticed then a change in the predator density since Dumfries and Galloway has become much more forested? Do you recognise this conversation? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I do. Um, but it, I, there are other kind of changes that are coming. I mean, everything's changing, whether or not it's connected with forestry. A big thing for me here is is um, is badgers in a way that we wouldn't have thought of badgers 10, 15 years ago. Badgers now turning up uh, five, six, seven hundred meters altitude out on open moorland, out on peatland um, at all times of the day or night. Um, that's not forestry specifically but it does reflect um i don't know it's interesting to hear um what phil <laughs> so phil saying here talking about um some of the knowledge gaps and some of the information gaps we have um it's quite clear that we're a little bit off the map here we're not really sure what what's there's a lot of big changes happening we can see species declining some species increasing huge land use pressures going around all the way across the board um the feeling is all the feeling is almost like the science the science is frantically trying to keep up with this situation um and so um yeah totally i recognize everything that everybody has said so far my concern my concern is slightly are we are we as a group of people gathered here this evening with curlew hats on, are we slightly are we slightly chasing the game on this? Given that we've decided that this woodland's going to be created, um, and then we're kind of desperately trying to 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 pack curlews onto the train that's leaving the station as we speak. Um, <laughs> so so that's just that's just a, a kind of attention that 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 I've kind of picked up a little bit from some of the other speakers so far this evening is is no, I mean, it's for sure, and I think. Um, you know there is a tension between forestry and curlews and and but given that we will have forestry and that we need forestry we have to have the very best sort of forestry possible and i wonder if phil you want to come in and say anything about that so i think um there's a couple of points are worth making firstly going back to that original discussion i i think it's worth making the point that the incentive mechanisms that we have for woodland creation do actually incentivize broadleaves over plantation. And that's an important point because in recognition of their biodiversity 
greater biodiversity benefits. I think that's an important point. And just uh, coming, I mean, what Rat is talking about is strategic planning, isn't it? Um, and basically spatial prioritization. And coming back to my thing I said in the intro, where as a as a sort of sector, as a as a conservation community, we need to be we need to be having a you know a discussion around what areas of the landscape we want to keep open and those that we want to see more wooded and i see that as a landscape scale kind of discussion it's not something that should be piecemeal and then if we do that and we do it effectively and people buy into it then we can do the kind of thing that russ is talking about and we will have areas where there is a presumption against any kind of of, of planting and areas where we really encourage planting and you know with the, the the new guidance we have done that to a degree because we are uh you know there is a there is a decision mechanism whereby if it's in an area that is you know where we think the losses are too great in terms of curlew and other waders uh, and where the benefits do not stack up then they will not they will not get the permission from 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 fc but I think where we want to go, and hopefully we, could, you know, assuming you know we have the right evidence and the right data, um, where we want to get to for the next iteration, is that we actually identify what we're calling wader recovery areas in in the English uplands and possibly in the lowlands as well, and we are starting to assemble data in Natural England, um, which will um, enable us to do that now. One of the constraints we have is we don't, if we had perfect uh, full survey information for curlew and other breeding waders, we could do it quite quickly, but we don't. Um, we have a partial survey from 2016, so it's already getting on a little bit, and we have the zonal mapping from BTO. And so what we need to do is to use that data and then use surrogates um, to, uh, to enable us to, to, if you like, have positive zoning and negative zoning so things like peat we don't want any planting on peat um, we could possibly allow more planting to happen on steeper slopes because waders tend not to nest on steeper slopes i don't think that's necessarily anything ecological or physiological on the waders part but they tend to be in wetter areas which don't tend to be on slopes um, so you know those are the kind of things we can do also we have um, you know, a network of special protection areas and SSSIs with waders as interest features. Um, and we know there is this relationship between the birds that actually nest within the SPAs and the SSIs and the adjacent land, which is effectively functionally linked to those sites, because we know that curlew that breed on designated sites feed and often may rear their chicks on associated uh, in by land which is not designated so there's all kinds of information we can throw in to actually identify these way to recovery areas having done that um, um, um with a you know where we can actually encourage you know planting away from those areas when we can't protect every wader with those areas i think we all realize that um, but where we do so where we do see losses in wader habitat um, we could use that as a way to get greater recovery actions within the wader recovery areas so this approach is a bit like biodiversity net gain approach so if we lose you know habitat for 10 waders then a certain amount of resource might go into the way to recovery areas to actually improve the, those recovery areas which could be active habitat management it could be like you know wetting up or better grassland management it could be predation management lethal and non-lethal um, and one of the other critical things so my experience of recovery projects over many many years where we can deliver one-to-one -one dedicated bespoke advice to land managers that has a massive impact on what you can deliver in terms of species outcomes. And um, I think getting that advice and that ownership and that inspiration to the land managers around curlew and other waders is absolutely vital. So if we could pay for that through, you know, losses of habitat elsewhere, losses of less good wader habitat, then I think that's the way to go. And there, you know, there has been a commitment made by DEFRA 
to look into both the, the identification of the way to recovery areas and also what they're calling a strategic mitigation framework, which effectively means, you know, what to do when way to habitat is lost. How does that actually, what does that actually mean for the other habitat? Because I think the other point is even where we still retain high density wader populations, it's not rosy. They're still, get, they're going down and we need to put in place a package of measures to try and stem the decline and then reverse them so that we can in some way, you know, mitigate or compensate for losses elsewhere. Sorry, that was a long answer, Mary, but. No, 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 it's, it's fascinating. And I think it just goes to show just how incredibly complex this all is. And that everybody wants to move in, in one direction, which is increase the biodiversity of the UK and protect waders. But boy, are the competing agendas going on. And I just wanted to bring Lisa in there. Um, Lisa, Forestry Commission, it's your, you know, joy and honour to to make all this happen. Is there enough land to that you think that 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 were you can find to plant all these trees on or are you short of land? That's a really good question, Mary, and it's very difficult to answer. In fact, we asked it at a, an interview recently for a new woodland creation officer, you know, what, what what do you think is the biggest constraint to meeting the tree, tree planting target? And what we were looking for really as an answer is availability of land for all the reasons that, that have been raised. And I mean, it, it just... It's just an interesting. This I've not done this job very long. I didn't work. I'd never worked in forestry before. I'd never worked with birds before. Um, and the, almost the very first thing I started to say when I when I got on site and dis discovered that we had situations where people wanted genuinely to get a lot of trees in the ground, which obviously we're very keen to 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 achieve. Um, but they've got priority habitat. They've got waders. There's no easy mechanism then to say to them. OK, you can't you can't plant here because you've got waders, but to actually enable them then to do something positive for those waders. That's not to say that incentives and grants for that don't exist. They do. But it, it's not a simple joined up process. And it, it's driven me mad from the beginning, really. And so it, to me, it's, it's it's absolutely fantastic that these more strategic approaches are being looked at, because you know where is your strategy? It's all very well saying you can't plant there, but if you're not then going to actually do something positive because it's a really good wader area you'll lose it to something or another and i think from from the forestry industry's point of view and we get this all the time what they want is certainty so although by developing the strategic approach you will be closing off some areas and opening up others there will be winners and losers at least people will know where they stand and one of the difficulties at the moment is people coming forward with schemes that they they have to go through a very long drawn out process of getting surveys done and all the rest of it to be told at the end of it i'm sorry you can't plant and that is that's worse really than being told at the beginning you know you're in the wrong area so i really think this is this is definitely the way forward Get, getting those maps basically with lines lines on the maps um it, it's really important to do that and phil just remember as well we, we'll have a load of um bird surveys coming through that can be used to help help put this stuff together I'm going to go to, to Russ now, Russ, because, um, you know, taking my CRP hat off for a minute and putting you in the spotlight, when we are faced, this country, with huge issues to do with climate change, to do with resources, I mean, we import 80% of our wood, apparently, I read today, which is a shocking statistic, I didn't realise it was that high, um, the need for wood is absolutely massive, I mean, should we really care about some wading birds? I mean, I think that's a lot of people will just say, you know, there are bigger fish to fry. If you don't mind me mixing up all my metaphors here. Yeah, and if we if we think about it again, getting a bit philosophical, so curlews are basically birds of man-made habitats in this country. You know, there's very very few curlew breeding in what you call a truly wild habitat. Most of it is managed to some degree. In lowland areas, it's managed farmland. In upland areas, it's managed. Um, for sporting or other interests and, and also for, for farmland. So, you know, there's very few curlews in natural habitats. So let's think about, well, you know, before we came along and, and did our thing a few hundred uh, to a few thousand years ago, where did curlews used to breed in this country post Ice Age? And they're probably restricted to, you know, high, boggy, you know, relatively inaccessible locations. A lot of the lowlands of England would have been one big wildwood. Um, and so what we're trying to do is get back to that very dominantly wooded landscape. We'd have hosted wintering curlews around our coasts and estuaries, I'm sure, but a lot of England wouldn't have been suitable breeding habitat for curlews a few thousand years ago. In all likelihood, it would have been been wooded. So we have to bear that in mind. But to counter that, curlew is a totemic species that is one of the 
familiar iconic species around which we can hang a lot of those discussions with the general public about nature recovery, which is so topical at the minute. And, and despite all the doom and gloom of the last um, few days of media headlines, what has been encouraging has been seeing the response of the big NGOs and also the wider public on social media, certainly the sort of social media that I follow, where there's been general dismay that, that the nature recovery targets and, and various things that have been pledged are potentially going to be, be rolled back on. And it's been interesting seeing DEFRA's response today. And I think that picks up the fact that people recognise that you know, they might not value the flora or the invertebrate assemblage that you get in a lovely lowland floodplain meadow, but they would recognise the curlews there and they'd want to protect those curlews. And so I think although we can have discussions about, well, what is the natural number of curlews in this country? You know, they are birds of man-made habitats, but 70% of England, or I don't know if it's the UK, so in England is farmland. So in that case, if we want to improve biodiversity, we've got to improve it on farmland and managed habitats. And curlews and breeding waders are a species that we can hang those recovery campaigns off because they're familiar, people care about them. And if you have good habitat for curlews, you've got good habitat for lots of other bugs and beasts and, and plants and fungi and things that are maybe less in the public eye. So I think as well as having this international obligation, we hold 25% of the world's breeding Eurasian curlews. So we have that responsibility in this country as well. I think there's something about the importance of curlew as a familiar species to farmers, to the public, to a variety of land managers that is going to help encourage people and, and galvanise people to really get behind these nature recovery targets. Because it's going to be a much harder sell doing it on a you know, a rare invertebrate or, or a plant. And, and curlew are one of few species that really get people moved and, and excited. And for that reason alone, I think it's important that we focus on those as one of those totemic species. Before I come to um, to Claire, I just want to go to, to Patrick. But you lost that battle, didn't you, uh, Patrick? Or are losing it almost. You're almost endgame, really, in Dumfries and Galloway. They haven't been able to persuade whoever they are that curlews are worth saving and that trees are actually a better solution at the moment. Why Why is that, do you think? Uh, I recognise, I mean, loads of stuff that's been said this evening has been really interesting. I recognise uh, probably the main theme is, is a very, very unstructured approach to land use change, which has ended up with almost places coming up for sale when the current farmer wants to retire. Um, and before you know it, uh, checkerboard just gradually just fills in. Um, one thing I'm really interested in, um, and actually be it really interesting to get people's um, take on this before the end of the session. Um, one thing that's, that I've been interested in through working for waders is a piece of work that's going on about um, wader habitats, or particularly curlew habitats, say they're planted up. Um, there are quite often um, recommendations, management recommendations that that um, are put forward to kind of mitigate the impact of of, of the planting on site, um, and they're based on a lot of relatively old science. And quite often, there's not a huge amount of follow up after the habitat transition has changed. Um, so I see stuff like leaving suitable curlew areas within a plantation and just leaving them as open areas. And there's, there's a few sort of techniques that are sort of wheeled out as mitigation measures. Um, but without any monitoring or any follow up, um, we don't really know in the long term whether or not these measures actually work. Um, and I, I was really appalled when I saw some of this stuff that was going on. I'm sorry, Mary, this is a, this is a slight tangent, but this is particularly something that I wanted to, to feed in at, the, at this stage. Um, if we don't know how to integrate curlews into these um, afforested landscapes and we're working on the basis of data that doesn't work, actually then I know landowners locally who have been really worried, really upset that their decision to change their land use will have knock-on effect on the curlews and they've then made the decision to go ahead with the forestry anyway because the forest developers have told them that it's OK, we'll do this, this, this and this, and you'll keep your curlews without any evidence that those methods, those methods actually work. And here we are five, 10, 15 years down the line. We've lost them. Um, so there's a really interesting piece of work going on with working for waders at the moment to try and actually gather together because, I mean, individual forest developers have this data. They know 
well, quite often they know, quite often they don't know, to try and collate this data and actually work out. Um, it goes back to some of the stuff Phil was saying earlier. So kind of we've all said, um, like, we are completely off the map here. We have no idea. We can surmise stuff. As a farmer, I, I mean, I can tell you what I see, but I, I can't necessarily provide you the data to back it up. So that was a really hair-raising moment from from my perspective to realize that actually even the stuff that we're told to do to mitigate the stuff <laughs> that the actions we're taking we don't even know if they work so so from from what russ has been saying and what phil's been saying in fact, what we've all been saying is maybe a slightly bigger a slightly more blown up more blown up perspective on how we mitigate stuff to almost not necessarily say on your 1500 acre farm if we're going to plant it we're going to do this this and this and you can save your curlews to say on your 1500 acre farm we're going to plant it but in an area where we prioritize curlews that actually stands a much greater chance of of helping we're going to do something good over there that to me makes way more sense but back to your point mary if you're not in a place where curlews are being prioritized that really sucks because you are then going to have to go through losing basically having all support withdrawn and people basically saying you're knackered that's the end for you and if you want to see curlews great go to the pennines go to the go to aberdeenshire go to certain pre-identified hotspots and that to me is like a, such a despairing point where we basically give up on trying to integrate birds into the landscape and we basically park them in the most convenient places and i completely understand why we do that but it is just a real punch in the guts if you are anchored to a place and you lose something that you then are going to have to travel three four five hours up the road to go and to go and experience the same thing that you took for granted when you were a kid that's 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 absolutely not what you wanted me to say just there, Mary. You asked oh, me quite a you. specific question, and I went completely off piste on it. <laughs> but I can't help I can't help hijacking this opportunity with a with a panel here. This is this is bread and butter for them. I'm really interested to kind of see how some of the things um, raised just there fit with an English perspective, because from that's a Scottish perspective, a, a, a some of that's really em emotive and emotionally put point. Thank you for bringing that up, um, Patrick, because you crystallise that so well there. And I'll say again, if you've not read Patrick's book, Native, please, please do. It will have you weeping and it will have you feeling utterly emotional in, in a really good way. It's, it's a fantastic book. But that kind of emotion about what it's like to live and love the wildlife around you is... I. I rarely come across anything better okay into the hot seat now then claire how on earth are you going to balance all this and are you really going to say to patrick's around england you're just knackered i'm afraid well i know i think patrick's point spot on in terms of the the kind of mitigation proposals on site uh, and you know that that's the view that we have too that you know unless you can really um I mean, for a start, you're uh, effectively sustaining compromised habitat, really, in term, it's not optimal if there are trees close to it. But also, you've got no um, legal basis for requiring that mitigation activity if it's predation control to continue in perpetuity. And, you know, obviously, woodland creation is a permanent land use change. So any... any um, any requirement for predation control has to be binding with the land and with the landowner. Um, who takes on that land if it's if it's sold? So it's a really it's a really tricky, tricky point. And I I we've concluded the same as you really, and hence the um, design of um, or the the desire to develop in England a strategic mitigation framework in the way that that um, that Phil's articulated prioritising that mitigation activity elsewhere. But I absolutely. <laughs> also sympathise with the great pain in basically losing those iconic species and, you know, the beauty and the experience of observing and um, hearing them in local landscapes. And that's that's tough. And I'm, I'm genuinely not sure what we what how we how we reconcile that if we want the land to deliver all these different um, policy objectives. There will have to be some trade-offs, and um, you know this may be one of them, which is very hard for us as um, nature conservationists to, um, and those who with a, with a real passion um, and love for nature to to accept. I was going to come back to the cumulative 
impact point, which has really been <laughs> the, 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 the thing that's been the most difficult um, issue to deal with, given the uh, really the, the kind of reactive nature of woodland creation applications, I suppose, in England. And um, I have to talk about it from an English perspective because I don't have experience of working in, in Scotland. But that 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 concern about what um, the cumulative impact of multiple small and often they are small as well. I mean, most most of the um, at woodland creation applications in in England, and I'm sure one of the Forestry Commission um, colleagues on this call, I know some are in the audience will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of them are only about seven hectares. So they are quite small scale, really. And, and many of them are much, much, um, you know, much, much smaller than that. What 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 impact they will cumulatively have, cumulatively have in an area where um, breeding waders are still persisting is um, and you know hopefully recovering is is not known and that's one of the reasons why we've commissioned BTO to do this work which is using the breeding bird survey data which is obviously about breeding weight of persistence it's not it's not looking at productivity but looking at that alongside um, the uh, forest research data set about woodland um, change in the landscape to look at um, breeding wader persistence in relation to changes in um, woodland cover. And uh, we're hoping that we're going to be able to um, integrate a fairly new data set, which, which has been developed under a DEFRA funded programme, um, which incorporates trees outside of woods, so hedgerows, shelter belts, other things which don't fit the definition of woodland, but trying to understand the role that those play in potentially um, in, in potentially hosting predators as well, because they they probably do. So um, so that 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 work will help to inform, in combination with the work that BTO have already done with the um, the, the the zonal mapping and the um, modelling basically of wader abundance from from bird atlas um, th that will that will help basically as be, be able to model potential cumulative impacts based on different um, uptakes of woodland creation across the landscape and I know that sounds fairly complicated and it's also probably likely to be a big um, estimate based on certain assumptions but that's about the best we can do really with the current evidence and um, I mean that's that's what we're trying to get from this bit of commissioned research to get us a step further in understanding what the cumulative impacts might actually result in in terms of the North Pennines population of curlies for example. Okay look thank you very much we're going to have to draw this discussion a bit to a close now so we can have some questions from the audience so if if Hannah and, and Roger have got some ready but just before we do that I just like Patrick um, bombed in there, photo bomb, did the equivalent of photo bombing a, a, a question to say what he really wanted to say about the, the curlews and forestry. Will each of the speakers, I just want, want you to tell me from your perspective, from working whether it's in the Forestry Commission or the CRP or as an ornithologist or as a farmer, what is the take home message that you want the people on this call tonight to know from what you're doing to try to save curlews? Will curlew survive alongside the huge pressure now to to go to increase woodland cover? And I'll go first of all then to Lisa on that. I think the take home message is how hard we're working to try to to make it work and to improve it. We've we've not got it right yet, but we're 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 working really hard to to do that. And just you know, the Forestry Commission deciding to employ ecologists for the first time, for example, was obviously a massive step in the right direction. And picking up on something somebody said just now, you know, I I go out and look at schemes as small sometimes as 0.5 hectares just to make sure because I don't trust looking at it on a map. Um, because, because it's really important to me that we get it right, whether that's for waders or for priority habitat or whatever. So I think that's a really important take home message. And I can't answer the second part of your, your question, Mary. I wouldn't know where to start. I, uh, and it, it is it is a big worry, I have to say, but we are really doing our best. And I do think that, um, you know, the, the, the work that we're doing jointly now with with uh, Natural England and others um, is, is going to be really important, really pivotal going ahead. Thank you, Claire. Phil. So I think my take home message is about being strategic and evidence based in this whole process. I mean, 
uh, if I was being cheeky, I'd say, um, you know, conservation in England has a long history of trying to, of failing to save everything everywhere. And basically, we don't want to go down that route. I accept exactly Patrick's point, but I think we're going to have to be more strategic to try and save things. And maybe some people are going to have to have a greater appreciation of black grouse and some pretty nice woodland birds on their local doorstep where and hopefully not go too far to see open habitats. Um, but I think, yeah, the way the way we could have our cake and eat it here is to is to be strategic buying areas we want to keep open and then really really kind of intensify the recovery management in those areas in the way I described throw everything at them um, and you know hopefully we can you know we will we, we will then be able to hang on to sustainable populations of curlew in England and in the UK. Thank you Phil. Russ are we are we heartened? So I think just to provide some, I mean, this this meeting is very focused on forestry um, and it is an issue that's coming down the tracks, but just to put it in perspective. So, you know, we are facing in the next couple of decades, the extinction of curlew as a breeding bird across the whole island of Ireland, all of Wales and all of lowland southern England based on current trajectories. You know, they're not even producing half as many chicks as they need to be. And in many areas, they're not even producing a quarter of the chicks that they need to be for a sustainable population. So that's the facts. That's where we are. The CRP are committed to doing what we can to maintain population and range. And so for the latter, you know, we're supporting the last ditch attempts such as head starting projects in far flung locations such as Dartmoor. We're doing predator control in places like the New Forest. We're trying to hang on to those little populations scattered around. But ultimately, if you are taking the pragmatic scientific view the trajectories that we're on it's going to be a few core areas in the uplands where we have the best chance of retaining this species in the decadal type of time scale i.e the second half of this century and if you think about it that way that's why i go back and i'm heartened to hear phil talking about strategic uh i, I love i'd be fantastic if the rest of government thought in a strategic way around conservation at the moment um because ultimately, if we do it strategically, we've got a chance of retaining those core populations in those upland areas. But that's that's the CRP's main concern is at the moment it's not strategic. And that's where we'll try and bring our expertise, evidence and campaigning through our member organisations uh, to bear on this issue. But it's worth bringing in that perspective. It's not forestry that's doing in curlews at the moment. It's predation and losses to agricultural operations that are hammering the productivity. And to be honest, they're going to be extinct across large swathes of the UK and Ireland if we don't tackle that in the next few years. Thank you. Uh, Claire, last word from you before we finish with Patrick. Yes, I'm going to agree furiously with what everybody else has said, but also kind of pick up on Russell's last point, which is we absolutely need the right incentives to uh, basically reduce the pressures associated with agricultural practice because, you know, uh, silage silage cuts or, or intensive grass management really poses a huge risk. And in, uh, we, we, we really do need that flip side of the coin in order to provide curlews with the best chance in the future. And as, as Lisa said, we're really working very hard collectively to ensure that the risk posed by forest, forestry is um, adequately addressed and mitigated. Thank you, Claire. Patrick, final word before we go to questions. Um, I just, uh, <laughs> it's difficult because I, I'm, I'm so um, closely anchored to um, a sense of place. I completely understand all of the very level-headed and pragmatic arguments but I think I just I I would feel silly talking as I do about curlews if curlews didn't specifically awake something very emotional very very subjective response which goes probably far beyond almost any other bird they do really stir you up and you I certainly struggle to think about them level-headedly so yes I agree um the best if the best chances of keeping them at all is to look at them in 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 a sort of a regional compartmentalization absolutely that's the way forward it doesn't heal the the hurt necessarily but i would say that if we are not prepared to as we've said throw the kitchen sink at those priority areas then then hell mend us because we we there's, there's no there'll be no coming back from that and i think that in itself 
is a huge amount of work to get everybody geared and pulling in the same direction. I wouldn't even say at the moment, Scotland, in lots of ways, Scotland has traditionally had potentially stronger wader populations, particularly in the in the uplands, uh, if not stronger than the perception of stronger, more across more across a more extensive area. And so, conversations I've had with with Scottish government and within agencies in Scotland have been increasingly shrill but not kind of pragmatic in the same way as England actually feels like England and to an extent Wales taking stuff really seriously we we do not have time to spare here whereas in Scotland there's still a little bit of well there'll always be curlies there's, I sometimes hear there's still a little bit of yeah there's, we've still got plenty more wiggle room and people are a bit sniffy about um, do we want to put electric fences around um, curlew nests? Yeah, well, that sets up precedent, and then we start chasing ourselves. And, um, so there's a slight kind of difference of pace um, between the two. I'm just um, learning a huge amount from this because um, I think in Scotland, if we hold ourselves slightly further, slightly safer than England, um, we are not at all. And so, um, I, I, and having identified priority areas. As I say, that's the full suite of stuff. That's that's proper integration of land use. That's predator control to a to a level that we, as I say, we we associate with shooting. We associate with grouse moors. We associate with upland management. Um, if we don't go full bore on this, then then we only have ourselves to blame. Thank you. I think it's been a, an absolutely fascinating discussion and about a bird that obviously, I mean, obviously stirs huge emotions and that's why we're all here tonight so uh roger and hannah have you got some questions for us i'm sorry we didn't have that much time so if you need to go but we'll try and answer as many as we can well um I, I, well i think the very best discussions go on like that and don't leave much room for questions um and so we've probably got room for two maybe two or three um when determining how many trees that uh, maybe the best thing is mary you you feel the question and then allocate it to one person when determining how many trees are needed for effective carbon capture, capture does this account for other methods of carbon sequestration? Uh, I, I will leave it up to you guys to, to say who would like to to answer that one. I, I can't answer it, I'm afraid it's not. So I don't know whether Richard, my line manager who's in the audience, has got anything he can say about that, but it's not it's not my area of expertise. So the question is, it's not all about trees, is it, for carbon capture, mm. but other mm. land uses as I'm, well? I'm, I'm happy to help answer it though. Um, yeah, I mean, ahead. I think the I think the short answer is that when the government came up with the strategy that gave it confidence to commit legally to net zero, it left no stone unturned. So, obviously, reduction in fossil fuel consumption, increase in renewables, tree planting, but also all the other technological solutions, including capture and storage, were were part of the of the reckoning. So um, yeah, short answer is yes. Anybody else got oh. anything to add to that before? Yeah, Russ? I was just going to say, so there is this nice work by Natural England that you can find online where they've looked at the different habitats in the country and how much carbon they sequester. Um, and things like peat bogs sequester way more carbon than any type of woodland. So no, actually, that's not true. That's not true. If you if peat bogs are really, really important carbon stores as carbon sinks but if you look at the rate of sequestration peat bogs grow very very slowly they accumulate carbon really slowly compared and the, and the work that natural england does um, which gives both sequestration and storage figures for those different habitat types as you're referring to demonstrates that woodland are by far the most important habitat type in terms of sequestration and of course it's sequestration that's vitally important if we're going to achieve net zero just to come, yeah, just come on with that. It's um, I mean, the storage of peatlands is is unparalleled, basically, and that's the other the other the flip side of that is ensuring that that carbon in those peatlands is kept yeah. safe. And one of yeah. those, one of Absolutely. the um, one of the ways of keeping it safe is is not planting trees on it, which oxidise yeah. it. So <laughs> they, they keep, have keeping it keeping it wet, keeping it wet exactly. and, and in good condition. Yeah. 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 Right. So um, mo moving on. Um, we haven't talked about whales at all, um, other than just tangentially um, with Russ's sort of forecast that the curlew's on the way out. Would anyone like to talk just a little bit about any the special Welsh situation? 
I think probably Ross is the best one to answer that at the moment. Has been sitting on most of the meetings for Curly Recovery Wales. Yeah, I was just typing in the link to the Natural England report. Yes, I should have said storage, not sequestration. Um, but I agree with Claire's point that yes, retaining peat bogs, which obviously also good breeding habitat for curlew, is key. I'll put the link to the report in the chat in a minute. Um, in terms of the Welsh situation, so. Curly Wales is a relatively new um, organisation that is, is like a, a similar organisation to the CRP in Wales. Um, they are first of all defining a series of important curlew areas, so around a dozen. And I totally sympathise with Patrick's point. You know, it's, it's a pretty hopeless situation in my backyard in the New Forest. Where we've got 40 pairs of curlew that have got awful productivity, but it doesn't mean we're not trying bloody hard to try and cling on to them and doing everything we can. Uh, and I think in Wales, yeah, there's a pragmatic view around trying to re put direct resource into these important curlew areas. And obviously they are going to be areas where any forestry applications are looked at particularly hard, given the real extinction risk of breeding curlew in Wales. But it doesn't mean that curlew whales aren't going to be supporting and, and, and helping landowners with smaller numbers of curlews right across the country. And I'll say the CRP is in the same position just because we may focus effort and I'm sure Natural England would say the same around their proposed wade recovery zones. Yeah, we're not going to ignore curlews outside of those areas, but you've got to start somewhere when you're trying to direct resources and, and, and such like. So, so it's that trade off between doing something pragmatic. And I think Wales, England, maybe to some extent um, Scotland, you know, we're all going to have to tackle that. Where do you direct the resource to get the immediate impact, but also to, to have that long term view? So the Wales situation is dire, but they are setting up these important curlew areas. They are trying to get some infrastructure support so that they can get a real network and a community developed and they're starting to get the attention of ministers uh, who are responsible for those um, important environment briefs as well. Um, and Roger sorry, Mathias, can I just, can I just say sorry. something about that Roger before we move on? I think um, there are all the, uh, in Wales they have massive issues slightly different I suppose to everywhere else everywhere is uh, different um, but talking to one of the main conservationists for curlews in Wales, um, he was saying, well, we can do all we can do all we can, but until we have fundamental root and branch change of the way we use landscapes, um, it's going to be very difficult to save them over large areas like Wales. It's just they're now so thinly spread and, and so clinging on to these declining populations as they are in southern England. I think it's um, quite a, a sort of serious situation. Yep. Um, so, right, so probably room, room for one, maybe two more questions. Um, Mike Smart asked um, uh, about half an hour ago, how much is forestation driven by bodies like Forestry Commission and how much by pure financial interests? And Tom question. Boyd came on afterwards and just talking about the green leads and all that thing. I was just wondering um, if anyone had any sort of interesting thing to say on that. Anybody want to tackle that one? Would you like to, Lisa? Is that part of? I don't think I know enough. I can it, say a few words, done. Lisa, if you are. OK, yeah, do you. Like yeah. To. yeah, I mean, well, let's think about what type of woodland is be being created in England currently. Uh, around 75% of it is native broadleaves. So the, the, the motivation isn't isn't profit. A, a lot of those will remain kind of no interve low intervention type woodlands with biodiversity as the primary um, objective. Now clearly there are some um, uh, landowners, particularly in the north of England, uh, but but increasingly elsewhere that are interested in producing some timber, capturing some carbon, um, creating rural jobs to continue supporting the livelihoods of families on the estate. And, 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 and they are looking to plant mainly conifers and we've got um, several large scale schemes in in the north of England that are exercising our minds at the moment because of potential conflict with breeding waders that that come from those um, traditional landed estates. There isn't in England currently the the pattern of investment forestry um, that we've seen in Scotland, particularly South Scotland over the last uh, decade by pension funds and and the like. It's very much existing landowners um, creating relatively small woodlands, as Claire said, the average area is seven seven hectares, and seventy five percent of what's happening is is broadleaves. In terms of forestry, England um, is activities. Um, the ministers asked that the woodlands that are created on 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 our own public forest estate 
are 75 percent broadleaf so um that's what's happening there's a there's a couple of schemes near near us um you know and that's set to continue um and the the partnership scheme that um fe are operating um has a bit more flexibility on that but it it requires public access and requires delivery of a raft of other public benefits, which normally means there's a good proportion of broadleaf woodlands and there would be no conflict with things like breeding, breeding waders. So, yeah, the situation in England is quite different to the situation in Scotland. Anything still on that, Patrick? With this big green investment, big money going into forest. Only just back to, I think that's well covered by a whole load of other platforms and conversations that have gone on, but um, suffice it to say that in the last what 18 months, I have five new neighbours, none of whom live within, well, probably within 100 miles, but certainly not. Um, oh, it's likely they don't live even in this country. So um, uh, certainly there's a there's a, there's a big um, Austrian landowner buying a lot of stuff at the moment. He was the big cheese a few years ago. He's actually a minnow now compared to who's buying land. Um, particularly when it comes to to sort of Gresham House, enormous, um, very well funded bodies my con my concern has been until this point that um sometimes when you go to speak to landowners and in an advisory capacity i've been to look at green lairds who want to integrate want to get the best out of their planting um quite a lot of the work that's actually transacted on the ground is undertaken by local forest developers um the lairds themselves might want to present a, a sort of a, a really nice diverse portfolio of different interests and preserve conservation and um, there was one site I was on quite recently where I was brought on to see if cattle could be brought in to sustain and, and, and improve open areas left within the left within the new forest actually no the whole lot had been planted by the contractors and the landowner didn't even know it um, so um, yeah this is a this is a serious this is a serious nightmare scenario going on here um, and it's interesting as well, as soon as I sort of put my head over the parapet and kind of voice notes of concern, I quite often get, we're never going to meet our, we're never going to meet our, 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 our British produced timber targets. We're never going to get there and we need to sequester carbon and we need to do all these things. I just don't recognise almost any of the arguments to support commercial forestry in the kind of commercial forestry that's being delivered in Galloway, um, particularly in a part of the country that is famous for its peat. Um, I mean, we had a, we've got a really nice open goal, easy to push door. Um, you were talking about mixing metaphors earlier, Mary. There's a couple for you. Um, there's a really nice, obvious direction of travel for Galloway to play its part in the future of a sustainable Scotland is with its copious quantities of incredible, exceptional, extraordinary and beautiful peatland. And we're just sticking trees into it. It's 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 crazy. So, um I, I, I realise that I effectively, as a as a as a curlew enthusiast, I only play one song. Um, I hope this evening um, I've played my song noisily. Is you don't you don't want what we've got? I promise you really don't want what we've got. Thank you, Patrick. I think we've got one last question, and then we need to, as you could hear, finish. Oh, I, I, I was going. I, I was making an assumption that was finishing. I mean, we oh, we okay. no, um, no we can. We can we can have another question, but is that a good time to finish or would someone no, like to say quite, something? It's a very different sort of question. Throw it at us and we'll see. Um, so if there is one more, because we haven't answered that many, really. Well, um, I was going to ask, <laughs> I was going to ask a question um, about whether you ended up with all these schemes, and everything else, you end up with a few island populations that then become genetically weaker. And that's what finally does for them. Is it? Do you answer that one? Um, I think if we if we go down the genetic route, it's going to be a long time. Uh, you know, I think we have to get down to very low numbers before there is genetic problems, um, because uh, with migratory species like curlew, there's always going to be a degree of what we call outbreeding, where you get some individuals, and you don't need many individuals. Uh, to come into a population to keep them secure from a genetic point of view. So the Welsh kites, for example, were saved by one German female that turned up there in the 1970s, I think it was, that effectively produced, gave enough genetic, but uh, you know, diversity to enable them to survive. So 
I don't think from a genetic point of view it'd be a problem until we get down to very low numbers. What can happen though is you have you know effectively functional um, extinction or or um, you know uh, an extinction debt that we can't deal with uh, because there and I think this is a particular problem for relatively long-lived species where you know we're in this situation now where you know there, there's still plenty of birds around in some areas but if they're not producing anything there's effective uh, you know extinction which is I think the point Russ was making about some of these populations um, where there's effectively zero productivity and I think that is what we need to be looking at uh, you know immediately is trying to you know these birds are long lived but um, without productivity we're just um, yeah it's all built on sand really. Um, that's great uh, many thanks Phil. Mary shall we bring it to an end yeah. there would you like to yeah. say some closing words? Yeah just thank you very much I mean that was um, it's very sobering but it's also been incredibly enlightening to hear everybody's different perspectives and that um, conservation is never a simple we'll do this and everything will be rosy uh, it's never like that in my experience my limited experience and, and you guys are much more experienced than me it's always complicated but if we don't get it right it's very hard to put wrong and everybody could hear the pain of, of Patrick over in Dumfries and Galloway and that is what we do not want to happen as we go forward with tree planting so I just want to say thank you to um, to our speakers to Phil Grice Russell Wynn to Lisa your surname Lisa again <laughs> Curse Lake sorry <laughs> Claire Pinches um, and Patrick Laurie and thank you so much for coming to another Curlew Action Seminar. We've got another one on predators in about two or three weeks time. Do sign up for that. That should be a nice lively one. Um, but the whole point of these is to present the complexity of conservation and how curlews have to find their lovely wild spirits and lives in our human conflict uh, world where actually it might seem hopeless but we're all really trying to do our best but we have to get it right otherwise it goes horribly wrong so thank you for your support tonight um, and thank you for all your comments and we'll see you in the predator seminar thanks everyone and good night good night thank you